It's my privilege this morning of uh, speaking to you about thankfulness. And, uh, you know, thanksgiving is the culture of heaven. I've shared uh, many times from this pulpit that a kingdom culture or a culture of the kingdom of God is a culture that is Christ-like. Christ-likeness in everything, everywhere. If people say, what does heaven look like? Well, heaven looks like Jesus Christ. Christ-likeness. And we pray that amazing prayer, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And when we look at this culture of thankfulness, it's not just one day. But today, what we've been doing today is we've been building something of a memorial of thanksgiving to our Lord. In the Old Testament, there were altars, there were memorial stones that that were erected by all the patriarchs going back, if we look at the right way throughout the Old Testament. But we are, under the new covenant, we are living stones. We are part of the house of God, the family of God. And when we come together, it is a spiritual sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And what we do on earth is we model and mirror what's actually happening in heaven. And I want to encourage you, especially in the season that we're in, is to cultivate an attitude of gratitude, regardless of your circumstances. A culture of thanksgiving. When we look at the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 9 to 11 very quickly. And it says, Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to Him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and they worship Him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and they say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created, and they have their being. In heaven, 24-7, they are giving glory and honor and thanks to God. In chapter 7, verses 11 to 12, it says, All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. In chapter 11, it goes on, verse 16, it says, And the 24 elders, this is again, who were seated on their thrones before God, they fell on their faces and they worshipped Him again, saying, We give thanks to You, Lord, God Almighty, the One who is and who was, because You have taken Your great power and You have begun to reign. We begin to see something of a glimpse of the culture of heaven where all these heavenly creatures constantly are giving thanks and praise and glory and honor to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it is the will of God that this culture of thanksgiving that is in heaven be on earth. There's something wonderful about when we gather together and we begin to just sing the praises of God and we give Him all the glory and the honor and the prayer that He is due. And we come before Him with thankfulness and gratitude in our hearts. It's amazing what it does. It's amazing what it does. I love what Colleen said. There's lots to worry about. There's lots to be concerned about. We can only imagine what the two of you go through in not seeing your grandkids in the flesh. And we want you to know, Frank and Colleen, we love you. We really do. We thank God for you. In fact, we thank God for your faithfulness, the two of you. You're a faithful couple. You've been faithful in this family, and we thank God for you. We really do. I want to just actually give you four things that are very, very important in cultivating an attitude of thankfulness. 
because it's not just for a Sunday meeting here at the junction. But I want you to walk away this morning with some keys around the area of thankfulness from the Scriptures that will stand you in good stead in the days, the weeks, the months, and the year to come. Amen? Are you ready? Paul the Apostle, I want to just speak about what Paul said in four different Scriptures about, about, about thankfulness. Very, very important Scriptures that we take hold of faithfully this morning. The first, Paul's first statement about thankfulness was this. In Colossians chapter 3, I'll read through the Scriptures fairly quickly because we're going to break bread in a moment. We're going to have a good feed together. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, it says this. Paul speaking to the church in Coloss, he says this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Now, we've heard this morning already from some of the testimonies that one of the, the big issues this year has been the issue of fear. And what we all need is peace, the peace of God that transcends all understanding. The Scriptures say, well, guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. But in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, Paul says this, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. What should rule in your hearts? Not fear and anxiety and worry, but peace should be the ruler in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. And there's the connection. There's the connection. Be thankful. It's in an attitude of gratitude, in an attitude of thankfulness, that peace will actually rule in your heart rather than fear. And being thankful is not a suggestion. It is a command. And Paul goes on in verses 16 to 17. He says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Verse 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Amen? Amen. Paul's second statement about thankfulness we see in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18. And in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18, Paul gives us an idea of what it means to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. He said this in verse 18, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And what is the result of being filled with the Spirit? So Paul is saying, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Not a one-off, but ongoingly be filled with the Spirit. And then he tells us what the result is of what what it looks like to be filled with the Holy Spirit when we read in verse 19. Let's go to verse 19 and verse 20. Paul said, "Speak speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's what should be happening when we gather together, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit that we're speaking to, another one, to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? The overflow or the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is a heart that's thankful is an attitude of gratitude, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything, which includes the highs and the lows, the trials and the tribulations, the successes and the failures, the overflow and the lack. Whatever the circumstances are, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. That's what flows on after what Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul's third statement about thankfulness we see in the book of Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. Wonderful passage. It can be a challenge. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. Paul said this to the church in Thessalonica. He says, 
Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Isn't that amazing? The will of God is to give thanks in all circumstances. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks to God in all circumstances. The fourth thing that Paul says about thankfulness is this. We see it in the book of Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Philippians 4 verse 6. Paul writing to the church in a city called Philippi. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. Can you say everything? Everything. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Isn't that amazing? Don't be anxious, faith city, about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. To God. Then it goes on to say that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. There's a direct connection between the peace of God and thanking God. Something happens when you begin to thank the Lord. And so God in these scriptures is giving us keys to walking a life of peace. And we need peace, a supernatural peace that transcends all understanding. When the world is anxious and the world is struggling, the world, it seems as if the world around us is falling down, you can have an inward peace that is supernatural because it is actually the peace of God. It is Christ Himself. This peace is powerful. It is the anointing of God Himself. It is an anointing that comes upon you that brings a peace that defies the circumstances that are going on around you. It's the peace, the Scriptures say, that transcend all understanding, where people go, how can you walk in peace in the midst of the storm? And peace has a word. It's Jehovah Shalom, the Prince of Peace. And what I'm realizing more and more, even in my own life, that an attitude of gratitude attracts the very presence and the anointing of God. We think life's tough until you walk in someone else's shoes. It's true. I can honestly say, and I don't want to put her on the spot nor embarrass you this morning, but uh, walking away from a conversation with Wendy during COVID for me was, it made comp- it just made no sense at all. Watching her and seeing her in the midst of the turmoil she's been through. It's the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Can guard a heart and a mind in the midst of bearing three family members. And and I believe you you took at least two of the funerals. (laughs) The peace of God that transcends all understanding. Absolutely amazing. Thankfulness doesn't just accomplish peace. But thankfulness provides access to God. And we read in Psalm 100 where it says, we must enter His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. There are protocols for entering into the presence of God. And I know under the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ, we have free access through the blood of Jesus into the presence of the Father Himself. But there's a way that we enter into the presence of God. We do with confidence and boldness, not in ourselves, but in the blood of Jesus. But there's a way we enter in. And how we enter into God's presence, we enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Isn't that awesome? Absolutely amazing. Psalm 95 says exactly the same thing. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving and extol Him with music and song as we did this morning. So a thankful heart and lifestyle doesn't only release the presence of God and the peace of God upon you, but it also unlocks the supernatural, miraculous power of God 
And we learn that from the story of uh, the example of Jesus in John chapter 6 when He fed the multitudes. He fed 5,000 men, let alone the women and children. And it's interesting when you go and look at John chapter 6 that many of us would have take, looked at the crisis. We would have looked at the small boy's lunch of a few fish and a few loaves. I would have begun interceding, Oh, Father, I know that you love them and that you want to feed them. Heavenly Father, help! You've got to feed them. And I'd be interceding and praying, but the Scriptures tell us that all that Jesus did was He took a small boy's lunch and He simply looked to heaven, to His Father. And you know what He said? You know what His prayer was? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I think there's a, there's a profound revelation in that because what we see here is that in Christ Himself, His, His heart of thankfulness towards His Father, all He did in that set of circumstances was just go, Father, thank you. You see, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, the Scriptures tell us Jesus promised the Father knows what you need. So if He knows what you need, do we need faith for our needs? Of course, we've got to thank Him for our needs. But what Jesus did here was He took the, what he, the, the, the little that He had. Thank you, Father. I think it's a great prayer. It was exactly the same. Another great New Testament illustration was when it came to Lazarus. When Lazarus had died and Lazarus was in the grave for four days. And of course, we know the story of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Jesus loved them. And Jesus deliberately delayed His trip. When He heard, when He was told that Lazarus was sick and on his deathbed, Jesus deliberately delayed his trip. And then when he finally gets there, they're weeping and they tell him, Lazarus is dead. And Jesus gets to the tomb. I can't remember if it was Mary or Martha, but one of the two said, Lord, don't roll away the stone. He's been dead for four days. And his body will stink. In other words, it will be decaying. And you know what Jesus did? He didn't pray. He looked to his Father in heaven and he said, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Incredible thing. I wonder how many prayers have not been answered because we've rushed in without an attitude of gratitude. We've had a shopping list. Whatever the need may be, we rush into the Father without a, coming into His presence with thanksgiving and praise, with thanking Him. I wonder how many more miracles will be released just through saying, Father, I thank You. Maybe our prayers will end up a lot shorter and answers a lot quicker if we approach God with an attitude of gratitude. I must end off this message with just briefly with the opposite of thankfulness. The opposite of thankfulness is a heart that is unthankful or ungrateful. And so Paul, when we look at the book of Romans, he describes the condition of the human race. And much like many of you, I've been struggling to make sense in my own limited understanding of the season we are in when I look around me and I see so much angst in the air. There's so much angst that is unbelievable. Wherever you look, wherever you turn, no matter what the sphere of society is, whether it's politics or whether it's religion, no matter what it is, there's angst in the air out there. I try to get, make sense of what's going on and all the cancel culture and all the stuff that's happening on the earth. And Paul describes this in the book of Romans. I want to encourage you to go and read Romans chapter 1. But in verse 21, when Paul describes that, uh, this, 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 this condition of the human race in Romans chapter 1, he tells us what led to this terrible decline and condition of the human race. And I'm just going to read you verse 21, and I want to encourage you to go and read the book of Romans, because it's given me clarity and understanding as to why people are behaving the way they are. And it says in verse 21 of Romans chapter 1, it says this, for although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him. 
But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so the whole context of Romans chapter 1, this dark period of time that we see in the history of the human race, which we are in, Paul the Apostle says, these things have happened. In other words, in fact, God actually says that He's given them over to a grand delusion, to patterns of thinking that have been darkened. In fact, the words actually say in Romans chapter 1 that God has given them over to a depraved mind, a depraved way of thinking. God has given them over to that. Why? Because they neither glorify God as God, nor do they actually give thanks to Him. And there's the key for that whole picture in Romans chapter 1. It's a tragedy. The second observation about unthankfulness appears in 2 Timothy. And 2 Timothy actually speaks about end times. And it says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 2. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Here it comes, ungrateful. Ungrateful, unholy. It's amazing how God links in that sentence ingratitude or unthankfulness with unholiness. To be thankful is to be holy. Thankfulness is a spiritual attribute that we carry. And when we actually see the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God, and that despite the fact that, that we, all the stuff we see when we focus on Him, our hearts burst with gratitude. We don't whinge and moan and bicker and criticize, etc., etc., etc. Incredible. Not only, is, is, not only do the unthankful find their place next to the unholy, but to be ungrateful is to be unholy. And the kind of conduct that you see that is the opposite of thankfulness is actually murmuring and complaining. Isn't it incredible? Completely opposite. Completely opposite. And so from these teachings, we see two possibilities. Thankfulness opens up the way to God's presence and to His miraculous, miracle-working power in your life and circumstances. I am convinced that when you go to another level this week from today of coming into the presence of God and just thanking Him and praising Him, and giving, giving Him all the honor that is due. You may not even have to ask Him for the things that you were going to ask Him for when you went to, into the presence of God in the first place. Because He knows what you need. He knows what you need. He knows that you need food on your table. He knows that you need a bed to sleep on. He knows what your needs are. He said, pagans run after those things. But seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. I'll give them all to you. Order. I'll give them all to you, said Jesus. We've got to learn as the children of God, as living stones that are being built into a spiritual house, that you on your own, or when you're with your husband, your wife, in your, in your context of your own household, just get together and count your blessings. And isn't a meal time a wonderful time, not just to thank God for the food? but to spend a longer moment and actually thank God for His blessings, even if it's just for that day, it attracts the presence of God and the peace of God. My family, how's this for a truth? If there's peace, if there's a lack of peace in your home, if there's strife in your home, cultivate a thankful culture, and that will automatically attract the peace of God. Amen?